Um, so I'd uh, just like to welcome everyone to the Colloquium on Religions and the Practice of Peace. This is our third colloquium. It's an opportunity for cross-disciplinary conversation and how people have drawn on religious and spiritual resources to foster mutual understanding, cooperation, justice and peace across differences of religion, sect, nationality, ethnicity and culture. How such efforts can inform contemporary peace building theory and practice and constructive rules for universities and scholars in this area. So, as always, we want to thank the Center for the Study of World Religions for hosting us. It's really great to be here. I know a lot of people put work into uh, arranging food and um, uh, seats and, 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 and things for us. And again, a big thank you to Liz Lee Hood, who makes all things happen. Um, uh, so, uh, appreciate that. And I know Dana will uh, introduce the panel formally, but <clears throat> I also want to just say a big personal thank you to those who have given up an evening to and uh, you know, uh, folks around the table who have real uh, recent knowledge of Northern Ireland who can help us think better about these things. So tonight's session is on Northern Ireland from conflict to peace and reconciliation, question mark. Um, so we're fortunate to have with us um, um, uh, uh, some of the regular members of our colloquium um, who have real experience in Northern Ireland. Um, I've asked each of us to try and, um, well not try and, make sure we don't, speak for ten, more than 10 minutes so we can free as much time because we've got a number of presenters. I thought it was best to have more um, uh, presenters from people with real knowledge of the plays. It seemed a waste not to use that. But one of the uh, downsides is that we're now on the clock. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, my co-host, partner in crime uh, in this colloquium, uh, Diana Eck, and uh, professor and director of the Pluralism Project at Harvard, to introduce our panel. Diana. Thank you, David. Um, this is a real pleasure to uh, be here tonight, in part because for me this is a real learning curve, uh, knowing something about Northern Ireland through the years, but uh, to have this group of people able to talk about it. So they're really going to initiate the discussion, and it's good that there are five of them. Uh, many of us know David Hampton, I hope so. He's been Dean of our Faculty of Divinity since uh, 2012 joined the faculty in 2007 from Boston University, where he was a university professor, and before that, a professor at Queen's University in Belfast, a social historian who has looked largely at uh, Protestant Christianity, populist traditions in evangelicalism in Europe and North America, books on Methodism, on evangelical Protestantism in Ulster society, religion and political culture in Britain and Ireland. Uh, he is very interested in his teaching, in his work, in his addresses, both public and to our faculty, about issue of religion and uh, political culture, identity and ethnic conflict, comparative secularization, many of the things that are important to the topics that we address in this colloquium. Margaret Smith, our next pr presenter, uh, is a scholar in residence at the International Peace and Conflict Resolution Program at the School for International Service at American University in Washington. She is the author of Reckoning with the Past, Teaching History in Northern Ireland. She researches and publishes on intergroup relations, on the very specific topics of dealing with the past, and is someone who has done a doctorate at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, is a member or was of the Harvard Program on International Conflict, and analysis and resolution with, uh, with Professor Herb Kelman from 95 to 99. She has worked in many kinds of Christian-based interfaith and ecumenical uh, initiatives in Europe and is spending 2014-15, uh, our academic year at Lesley University, to uh, explore more deeply the nature of personal healing and post-conflict in other contexts. Then uh, Dr. Hugh Doherty here was raised in Northern Ireland. Uh, actually, he shares that with uh, our dean and with Luann as well, whom I hope is here tonight. Luann, good. We have some who have personal experience of this um, from their upbringing. And Hugh teaches leadership at the Kennedy School, uh, senior associate in the Cambridge Leadership Associates. He's taught leadership and conflict resolution at the Jepson uh, School of Leadership Studies, the Gray Gregor McGregor Burns Academy of Leadership at the University of Maryland, where he directed the Ireland-U.S. Public uh, Leadership Program for Emerging Leaders 
for all political parties. Uh, he has so much ex uh, uh, sort of background in issues of leadership with many kinds of organizations. He also has consulted in Bosnia, Croatia, Cyprus, has addressed the UN Global Forum on reinventing government, has worked even in Nepal on negotiation and leadership development. He earned an M. Ed. and EDD from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And Dr. Trelawney Grenfell Muir is uh, someone who has done an MDiv at Boston School of Theology. Concentration in Religion and Conflict was a fellow at the Institute of Culture and Religion and World Affairs at the Earhart Foundation and has conducted research on situations of ongoing conflict in Syria, Lebanon, and Northern Ireland. Her dis dissertation explores the methodology, the constraints, the effectiveness of clergy peace builders in Northern Ireland. And she has spoken at many uh, venues in the Boston area on these very issues. She is working on a, a number of projects, has uh, seen her own work published in the Journal of Interreligious Studies, as well as the book Overcoming Violence, Religion, Conflict, and Peacebuilding. And she's worked with the Religion and Conflict Transformation Center at Boston University. And finally, uh, Father Ray Helmick, uh, a priest in the New England Jesuit province. Uh, Father Helmick is an instructor in conflict resolution in the Department of Theology at Boston College. He was senior associate from 2000 to 2004 <coughs> at the Preventative Dipl Diplomacy Program at the Center for Strategic and International Sunday Studies. And he has worked as a theologian in conflict mediation and reconciliation. Since 1972, over these many years, he's worked with the parties in conflict in Northern Ireland, as well as with Israelis and Palestinians, uh, the countries of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, he was associate director of the Center for Human Rights and Responsibilities in London from 73 to 81, co-founder of the Center of Concern for Human Dignity, a joint project of the English and Irish Jesuit provinces. And from 79 to 81, uh, co-founder and senior associate in the Conflict Analysis Center in Washington, D.C. He did his education, part of it, at Weston College and at Hochschule St. Gordon at Frankfurt and Union Theological Seminary. And mm -hmm. he has been editor with Rodney Peterson of the book that uh, many of us know on forgiveness and reconciliation, um, author with Richard Hauser on a social option, a social approach to planning, uh, a social planning approach to conflict in Northern Ireland, and many other books that grow right out of the soil that we're uh, tilling tonight. He has two books for this year, which is really rather amazing, published in 2014, Fear Not, Biblical Calls for Faith, um, and The Crisis of Confidence in the Catholic Church, both 2014 publications, and I might also say, Father Helmick not only works internationally, has been very engaged with some of the deep conflicts in the Boston area that have concerned over the years the Islamic Center, the Christian churches, and the Jewish communities. So it is a pleasure to welcome everyone tonight and to uh, get started on this panel, which clearly includes people who have had some real experience in this area. So I'm going to move from the chair here so that um, David, when he is, when we're all finished, can take over moderating this session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anna, very much. Um, so off we go. I, I see myself as a kind of, um, you know, one of those TV programs where someone is sent on to be the warm-up act, um, uh, because there's a great deal of expertise on the table. And I um, actually left Belfast in 1998 when the peace agreement was signed and, and made um, the decision to stay in North America a few weeks before 9-11, so I'm not a good guide on anything. Um, but um, I, uh, because we're going to be operating on quite a, a, um, a, 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 a tough time schedule, and because I imagine that quite a few people in the room may not know very much about Northern Ireland or how it got to be that way, um, I, I'm going to spend some time trying to sketch in some ways of thinking about how um, we got to where we are now. 
Um, so um, I, I think you may have access to a handout which um, might uh, help you um, follow this quick pace diction which is going to follow. Um, so you can see the framework, the introduction, w ways of conceptualizing and understanding uh, Northern Ireland, um, settlements and non-settlements, the history of failures um, in Ireland, and then some of the most important issues that I can see that um, uh, need to be tackled now. So I come at this from three perspectives. Uh, as a person who grew up in Belfast, grew up in uh, Protestant East mm -hmm. Belfast in a working class family there, um, went to uh, college in Belfast, Queen's University in Belfast in um, 1970 to 74, which, in, um, which were the worst four years of the Troubles uh, consecutively in terms of the number of people killed in the province. So that was a great shock, I think, as a young adult. Um, and then the second perspective is someone who became an Irish historian um, within a British Isles and Western European context. And I had three main projects I worked on. One was uh, religion and the formation of a provincial identity. I did a book with the, the director of the Women's Studies Program in Belfast on how a particular Protestant frame of mind uh, got established in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, then worked on religion and political culture. Um, uh, did a book with, which came out of the Cadbury lectures, which I, I know uh, Wilfred Cantwell Smith also mm -hmm. gave, mm -hmm. on um, religion and political culture mm -hmm. around the British Isles. There are a couple of chapters there, one on the making the Irish Catholic nation and the, Ulster, the other, the Ulster Protestant frame of mind, uh, which was to try and get at the heart of those religious traditions. And then finally, I worked as an urban historian on the uh, religion in the age of great cities, and I looked at Belfast as, a, as uh, then the fastest growing city in the British Isles in the late uh, uh, 19th century, and also, um, by most measurements, one of the most, if not the most violent city in the British Isles, uh, Britain and Ireland, uh, um, the archipelago, even how you call this uh, uh, place is, 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 is sometimes problem problematic. Mm -hmm. And then I, I come at it as someone who lived through many iterations of peace process of, uh, processes until the uh, Good Friday Agreement, so-called Good Friday Agreement of 1998. So how to begin thinking about this problem? And I, I say here that these are Van Gogh or Van Gogh brushstrokes. This is pretty broad painting, um, uh, which the people around the table will know. I give six frameworks for thinking about it. The first is territory and the importance of land, settlement, and migration. The 17th century saw one of the biggest land grabs in European history. At the beginning of the 17th century, most of the land in Ireland was in the hands of um, uh, uh, Catholic Irish. Uh, by the end of the 17th century, as a result of um, plantations, migration, population movements, and war, 90% uh, of the land was owned by Protestants. Um, so it was a it was a complete swivel of who owned land and power through that. Uh, and that's still why I think land is such an important element in the Irish conflict. You can see this in um, uh, uh, current day loyalism. Where you can march is where you can control. It, it's a territory that, that's under your jurisdiction, which is why these orange marches and so on attract such um, uh, attention. And, um, uh, of course, that territory grab was also associated with religion and power. There were penal laws throughout the 18th and 19th century against Catholics from inheriting land and a whole bunch of other things, and um, sacramental tests involved in holding a political office and so on. So there was a considerable amount of, um, uh, of um, religious interaction with that. During the 19th century, there's a fairly substantial migration into cities in Northern Ireland, especially Belfast, which emerges as a major industrial city. And uh, the migration came from um, parts of uh, rural Ireland which were already experiencing conflict between Protestant and Catholic agrarian societies. And when the settlements happened in Belfast, um, they were heavily segregated right from the start. In other words, areas that Catholic migrants settled, areas that Protestant migrants settled, and these became locked in. So territory, land, settlement, migration, those patterns are big. <coughs> Secondly, politics. Um, in the 19th century, you have the rise of competing nationalisms in the age of nationalism. Um, in other words, <laughs> Ulster Protestants um, almost uh, all became unionists. Uh, that is, they wanted to maintain the union with Britain. 
whereas um, many Irish Catholics by that stage wanted either some kind of home rule or some kind of independence from Britain. So, um, so maybe the big story of the history of 19th century Europe is the rise of nationalism. The rise of nationalism in Ireland was a competitive industry. Um, that's why things like flags and so on are just so vital to, to people. These are major symbols of national identity, British or Irish or, or whatever. Economics, um, right from the start, you have differential access to jobs and prosperity. Um, um, and of course, this uh, uh, begins to give rise to real stereotypes that Protestants are like Weber's Protestant ethic. They know how to work. They know how to get things done. Catholics are feckless. They have over large families. Um, um, I, and these kind of stereotypes really were quite, um, you know, uh, strongly established. Still are in some places. Um, and, um, and even just before the outbreak of the Troubles, the differential rates in unemployment and so on were really very significant. And as you know, one of the big issues was even fairness and allocation of housing and jobs, a whole range of things that uh, Northern Irish Catholics uh, felt with very good justification uh, were being um, um, uh, turned against them. Culture, the rise of cultural nationalism, uh, Northern Irish Protestants and Catholics often play different sports, educated in different schools, go to different churches, drink in different pubs, uh, play different music. Um, there's a big cultural separation there. Religion. Not as doctrine. I mean, some people come say, "Oh, it's not a religious problem because you know people don't even know what transubstantiation is or what the Reformation might be about." But that's not the point. It's the cultural DNA. It's the modes of practicing, expression, organizing, socializing, conceptualizing, even demonizing, um, um, which religion acts as a very important uh, instrument of. And then power, um, uh, differential access to political power leading to competition and control. So those are six frameworks, I think, that uh, help you uh, see the depth of these, um, uh, of these differences. Then I, I put this section in of settlements and non-settlements because it's very important, I think, for us to see that um, there's, some, there's a way of thinking sometimes that the Irish problem got to be this way, and then there's an attempt to solve it and, uh, during the Troubles, and, and that's where we are. There's really been a history of settlements, or uh, attempted settlements and solutions. The, the first one, of course, was the British state's solution in the 16th, 17th century, which is Protestantize, colonize, civilize, and decatholicize the island. That, that, was a, that, was an, that was an effort. That failed. Um, the second was revolution. Uh, Ireland had its own revolution in the age of the Atlantic revolutions, like, the, like America and France, except it failed. Um, uh, the 1998 rebellion uh, uh, simply didn't succeed. It was an attempt in the 19th century to give Ireland home rule and self-government. That failed. There was an attempt to uh, create partition and uh, the establishment of the Northern Irish border with the Republic of Ireland um, um, in the 1920s. And that largely, I think, uh, has failed, or at least um, it, it, it certainly hasn't been a conspicuous success. And then through the Good Friday Peace Agreement, another attempt has been made to uh, find a way of solving a problem um, through power sharing, through contiguous governments finding an agreed solution, through a lot of economic investment, through sophisticated methods of um, uh, 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 elections and um, allocation of power, um, some of which, um, some of uh, uh, the political scientists I know think that all that that has done is really institutionalize sectarianism for the long haul. And that's a, a point worth thinking about. So that one's pending. We're pending at the moment on that one. And then finally, what are the most important issues and what can be done about them? Separation and segregation is still a big thing. I mean, 93% um, of, uh, of um, uh, 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 school children in Northern Ireland are educated either in uh, controlled Protestant schools or Catholic <laughs> schools. The integrated education sec sector is about 7%. There's still a very high degree of residential segregation in, in uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland. There's peace walls still across the city of Belfast. And there's still a good deal of cultural separation. You look at the icons on the walls of, of gables in, in Belfast, and you'll see exactly what uh, those conflictual identities are. 
So separation and segregation are really strong, um, and the peace agreement of 1998 um, has, I think, had a limited impact on that in the long haul. Then there are deep structural instabilities in the place. A culture of violence still exists in Northern Ireland. I have a friend, uh, Liam Kennedy, in the uh, history department, who's just published a study um, showing the degree of um, uh, uh, beating of, of children by Protestant and Catholic paramilitaries, over 500 incidents uh, catalogued, and, and, and uh, um, that that is still going on. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not over. And there is still a culture of violence that's not as strong, obviously, as it was um, um, uh, in the 1970s. Profound economic weakness, and the Northern Irish um, uh, statelet, or state, whatever you want to call it, or province, um, uh, gets a net huge subsidy from the, um, uh, the British Exchequer each year. And the industrial base is too low, the service base is too high. And, and there's still a lack of jobs for um, a lot of working class people on both sides of this divide. And the fact is we still have a border. You know, you can massage it, iron it, and open it, and, and take giant army um, uh, positions out of it, but it still exists. So I don't think there are quick or easy fixes given this kind of um, uh, lineup. And I guess the big question we're thinking of tonight is what um, can churches, religious groups, or uh, other things that might make a difference in it? So over to uh, Mark. David, thank you. You really kept the time, too. I will say that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, David. I'm going to talk about the peace process since 1998. Because actually the Northern Ireland peace process has moved forward admirably in many respects. Government power sharing mechanisms are up and running. Police reform has been carried out. Paramilitary weapons decommissioning was completed in 2010. Devolution of policing and justice institutions from London took place in 2010 also. And the British Army presence has been dramatically cut back. These were all big concerns that were addressed by the Good Friday Agreement. Addressing community violence at neighborhood interfaces, that's places where you have Protestants and Catholics close together in neighborhoods, showed some progress early on, but it seems to be worsening right now, introducing a more general fear of backslide. This neighborhood situation probably correlates with higher unemployment due to the recession. And we could therefore hope that it will ameliorate with time. Much to be said about that, but I won't uh, continue with that line of thinking right now. I want to talk about two aspects of the process that as yet are not fully resolved. First of all is addressing the needs of victims. Research shows that those most harmed by the conflict are the ones least likely to respond to bridge building endeavors. The conundrum that emerges, therefore, is how do you help those who were most traumatized during the conflict to soften the intensity of their feelings about core political issues? The authorities were surprisingly slow at aggressively addressing the needs of victims. But in 2006, a commission for victims and survivors was set up, and since then we have seen much more energy around this issue. Meantime, a number of single community victim support groups had already emerged. And while indisputably offering needed support, they have also contributed to ongoing community divisions through a vehement discourse of victimhood on both sides. Unionist victims are locked into a discussion of the definition of victim since they consider themselves the only legitimate victims. Nationalist victims focus their advocacy on a societal truth process. It is being suggested that the vehemence of certain of these groups correlates with the extent of their unrecognized suffering during the conflict. This brings me to the matter of dealing with the past, which has been described as the most contentious issue remaining on the table. Emerging international norms on transitional justice 
suggests that a public societal process of truth finding is helpful in enabling a society to draw a line under its conflict and move on. Northern Ireland's current process of dealing with the past is a homegrown form of transitional justice that amounts to something less than a public societal process. Perhaps surprisingly, this process nonetheless seems to have some cross-community support, and it is being tweaked and improved as it goes along. So, some background. First, the idea of a truth commission for Northern Ireland, though much discussed, never got off the ground. This was due in part to problems in finding consensus around the nature of such a process, but also to fears in certain quarters that a public airing of all grievances would increase contentiousness rather than reduce it. Nationalists have generally supported a public truth commission process, preferably with international oversight. Unionists have always shown reservations. Offsetting the absence of a truth commission we must remember, has been significant use of the legal machinery, leading to several inquiries, most notably the Stevens, Corey, and Saville inquiries. The latter, the Saville inquiry, is more popularly known as the Bloody Sunday inquiry, which found British paratroopers culpable and led to an apology by Prime Minister David Cameron. In 2005, the chief constable of the police created a process for investigating the past called the Historical Inquiries Team. The Historical Inquiries Team method is to take each case of a death in the Troubles one by one, <coughs> go to the families concerned, tell what is known, and answer any questions. To nationalists and Republicans, it is hugely ironic that the process of investig investigating the past would land in the hands of the police, given emerging evidence of the collusion of the security forces with Protestant paramilitary groups. In order to address this concern, in 2009, a cross-community consultative group on the past recommended that the historical inquiries team be taken away from police jurisdiction and placed in the hands of a more neutral legacy commission. This ended up not happening because of lack of agreement on the terms. As a result, nothing has changed and the historical inquiries team has continued its work. One critique of the historical inquiries team coming from the nationalist side is that the process is a private one designed to address the micro issues around each of the 3,600 deaths rather than the macro issues of group outlooks, behaviors, and policies. But there have been other critiques. In 2012, an independent inspection of the historical inquiries team was inaugurated. Its 2013 report found serious deficiencies. The report called for standardized procedures and an oversight panel. Most importantly, the report highlighted that the historical inquiries team treated deaths where there was state involvement, in other words, military or police involvement, differently from those deaths where there was not state involvement. The inquiry found this policy to be a contravention of the European Convention on Human Rights. So the... Uh, Inquiry has requested that the historical inquiries teams address this and correct it, um, and we haven't got very long track record of evidence to, to say whether they have done so or not, but that's where we stand at the moment. Very significantly, however, the inquiry report ends with a paragraph saying that while the investigators spoke with many who wished that this historical inquiries process was independent, all expressed a desire for the process to continue if, correction act, if corrective action could be taken. In summary, once more, the deep social divisions have rendered it impossible to find an approach to addressing the past that pleases all. But against this background, it is highly significant that so many of those interviewed during this recent inquiry wish that the historical inquiries process would continue. 
we might be led to wonder, therefore, whether we are seeing a softening of contentiousness around this issue. And I do not know the answer to this question, but it would be my question if I was able to go to Northern Ireland and ask people. Now, Dean Hempton has asked us each to come here tonight with an ideal solution to the process of Northern Ireland, or not, maybe not a solution isn't quite what you asked for, but an inter a single intervention, perhaps that's a better way to put it. And I, um, I mean, this is, of course, an impossible question. He knows it. But um, I uh, would like to kind of throw out a desire for investigation in a particular area, put it that way. This is the way I think about it. Power-sharing politics makes it unlikely that a unifying political figure will emerge. For example, a parallel to Mandela in South Africa. So is this a space that the clergy or people resent, representing religious communities could fill through some kind of inter-religious endeavor. If this is worth exploring, I would not limit the participants to Catholic and Protestant clergy, but I would like to see an intelligent and imaginative inter-religious project that drills down to people's ordinary life in order to address trauma, create a larger vision of the future, and promote a change of outlook. Perhaps this argues for the emergence of a global interreligious spiritual movement. And this sounds like a kind of utopian hope. But the urgency of the need in places where religion has been a source of division suggests that future-oriented clergy in such places should be leading the way. Now, many of you who are spending more time than I am thinking about how the clergy respond to the conflict, of course, have much to say on this subject, and I look forward to hearing your comments on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, it was interesting listening to Margaret's presentation. I was thinking, you know, when she talked about the, the need in Northern Ireland to set up an inquiry to examine another inquiry, I thought, there's the whole story. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, I was uh, program director in a peace and reconciliation center in Ireland, the Glen Cree Center for Peace and Reconciliation, just outside Dublin. And we were bringing Protestant and Catholic together for, in dialogue. And then as we reflected on the work, we realized, you know, this conflict is, it's not going to be solved within Northern Ireland. That the, that the conflict here is, reflects a much lo uh, older co historic conflict between these two, you know, nations, England and Ireland. And it was like, here we are, you know, Protestant and Catholic in the North, we're like the the children of a bad marriage, you know, where the, the focus is on the children, fix the children. Meanwhile, the, the, these, these parents are like, don't get along. And so when we, when we looked at what was happening, it, it seemed like there was no dialogue happening across that boundary at all. It was quite stark. And it's still the case, as far as I can tell, that there, there's just, you know, the, the boundary between England and Ireland is just very stark. So we decided, why don't we start bringing Englishmen and Irishmen together? And we, I remember the, the very first uh, workshop where this happened, for me, it was a profound confrontation. One of the Englishmen in the, the workshop, he started to speak. And, uh, you know, he spoke with a very BBC accent. Hello, chappies. And uh, <laughs> I had uh, tea with the Queen the other evening, you know. And, uh, this, this sort of accent that my background, it was like you wanted to kill. <laughs> One party wanted to kill. The other party wanted to disappear. You know, like just utterly intimidated by it. And, but he told this story of like at the age of eight where he's plucked from his family and put in one of these English public schools. And I don't know if you know much about the, that public school. The purpose, the hidden purpose of the English public school system was that these young, young boys were taken from these usually elite families. And they were in this system, they were systematically brutalized, you know, by the older boys in this pecking order. And then they, were, then they went to places like Eton and Oxford, and they eventually ended up in the, 
African Indian positions of authority on behalf of the British colonies, and they could, they were able to to rule and not be affected, touched, you know, by the 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 pain and the poverty around them, because they've been so brutalized in their own emotional being. And as this man told told the story, he started to weep, and I was caught. I had been to a, a boarding school in Ireland, where every teacher had a a strap, mm. uh, a leather strap with a piece of lead inside it. Mm. So, you know, it's hard to believe that just a generation ago, but that's how it was. And, and so, but this moment, and, and you know, nothing prepares you for it. It's like, okay, one option is to keep his story at bay, to keep, keep away from it, because if, uh, if you allow that story in, then what? Uh, to, to keep him out, to keep him as the enemy, you know, to keep him as the, the reason he represents everything that we hated, everything that we blamed, uh, you know, the responsibility for all, all the troubles in Ireland, were, he, he represented that. But to keep him there and not be touched by his story and his humanity meant that then, you know, you have to, you have to close down your own life, your own emotional being, your own, you have to close your own heart. And that's a profound cost. The other possibility is you, is you get touched, which I was by this man's story. And then you're thrown into this moment where who you were a moment ago is, sh starts to shift. And to me, that's, that's the key challenge in this issue, this work of conflict resolution. Because you, your own community, your, your own group don't want you to sort of disturb the boundaries of... of uh, you know, the story, the narrative about history, the narrative about who we are. And we need the other, we need the enemy to, in order to know who we are. That's the, that's the irony of this, of the whole business. Um, but, you know, I was, I was caught and I was moved by his story. And then, you know, it, it, uh, I, I learned a lot from that experience. And I want to just share three, three points that I think were significant for me out of that moment, actually. First is I think that at the core of th this type of very apparently intractable conflict, at the core, at the root, is this issue of identity. Uh, a deep fear for, an existential fear for survival. And the irony is what I call, I refer to as the paradox of identity, that the very thing that people feel they need to hold on to to protect, the very act of trying to, trying to protect it, ironically creates the very conditions where it's threatened. And both communities, you know, are like uh, uh, co-create this system of enmity, in which there's no way out. Uh, so, in a sense, it, it seems crazy, but people choose conflict rather than peace, because there's something I think we need to understand about what is it that's at stake if people, uh, you know, risk letting go attachment to identity as we understand it. The second point, and it's built on, builds on that, is that I think that a lot of the, the efforts at conflict resolution, they're built on an illusion. The illusion is that, you know, if I'm Palestinian and you're Israeli, and we, we get together and I share my story as a Palestinian, you share your story as, as an Israeli, somehow we'll humanize one another and we'll understand one another's uh, story, and out of that we'll, we'll make peace. I think that's an illusion because, for me, my experience is, if dialogue is real, if people who, conf who, who need one another, you know, and, and holding on to one another's enemy in order to have a sense of who they are, engage really in dialogue, and, and deeply in dialogue, you cannot come out the other side as you went in. It's, you, just, you just can't. So the idea that, you know, you can well, come out of that process intact is, I, I, I think, uh, it's problematic you know, that, that that idea is still held out. And the third point built, comes from, based on those two, is that I think we need to redefine what success means in the world of peacemaking. Mm -hmm. Too often success is seen as the signing of a peace agreement. We've seen this in Northern Ireland. We've seen it in, you know, the, that famous picture of Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat shaking hands in the White House. 
And then they, then they get the no, Nobel Peace Prize. Same happened in Northern Ireland. David Trimble, the leader of the Unionist Party, and John Hume of the Democratic, uh, Social Democratic Party, were given Nobel Peace Prizes. Which isn't to say anything about their work, but it's just the, the idea that, that that's what gets rewarded, you know, that's what's seen as success. I think that's a real problem. In, in Northern Ireland, for example, the day after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, George Mitchell's on a plane out of there, and the whole thing crumbled. They had to bring him back and gather all the parties together again. And then it took another nine years, nine years before the parties could actually sit in the shared government. And uh, so I think that there's a way in which that's difficult enough, you know, getting a peace agreement, but the real work, the work that we're not really equipped yet for is it's the next moment. It's what's required for people to live into a new relationship which have no idea what it is and it's, and it's, and, and, and it's terrifying in a sense because you, you have to give up what we know. And what's required to hold people through that process, to, to understand what that process is, and to hold people through that, I think that's, that's as far as I can see, is like missing in the field of conflict resolution. And so that, that's why we, that's why su success is seen in the, the, the writing of the agreement. Uh, so th th those are the three points I'd like to make. One, you know that, that I think that at the core of these this con these conflicts is this issue of uh, attachment to identity and, and the fears connected to uh, releasing something of that, that attachment. Two, that uh, that dialogue it really is um, there's a loss you know, that you cannot come out with your identity intact if it's real. And three, that we need to redefine the process and what success means in, uh, in terms of um, seeing success as the implementation of a, a, a new relationship that we, people don't even know what it is until they live into it. And that, that peacemaking has to include uh, a process of understanding that and holding people through I into that implementation phase and not just the agreement writing piece. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lonnie. I'm just going to take a second to just set up my computer. You know, I have a science background, so I get an allergic reaction to giving talks without slides. So, sorry, dude. This is going to kind of break the window. This has to move. See this all right? This all right? Um, I want to say I really appreciate so much hearing what. Um, wait, what just happened? You know, this happened last time too. Network. All right. Um, I'm going to try not to overlap too much. I agree with the statements that everyone's been saying that Northern Ireland is still a conflict zone, and what I'm looking at is ways in which clergy, as Margaret mentioned are actually uniquely suited to help in some of the ways that still need help. So again, I, Northern Ireland's not post-conflict, it's conflict by other means. And one of the reasons I wanted to point out for that is that even though the Unionists supported the Good Friday Agreement, barely supported it by their vote, they hate it. I mean, they resisted it at many turns because it's a very threatening document to them. And also, <coughs> during the conflict, people could just scapegoat the paramilitaries. All these thugs are killing each other. That's the problem here. But it wasn't the problem. And once they stopped killing each other, people had to take a good hard look at the real sectarianism that was actually the root of a lot of the violence. And so the clergy that I looked at experienced all kinds of resistance, even up to death threats, just for things like wishing happy Christmas to someone from the other community. I mean, only probably 3% of people think they're going to return to Troubles era war. But maybe less than 20% actually think things are going to get better in 10 years, be more peaceful, more stable.
So for my suggestions, I have basically two suggestions. One of them is that I believe we need to break open some of the traditional ideas about the boundaries of political power and public space and look at more sort of non-traditional ideas of governance. Because the politicians, as David was talking about, they're really stuck in a tribal mindset. And part of that is that it's a confessional system. And part of that is just that's the way their constituencies want them to go. Because you know, as you said, you know, people choose conflict. But there are ways that citizens can influence public power indirectly and uh, can actually shape and inform the way that governance happens. And when civil society is involved in a peace process, it really increases the durability and stability of that peace process because people feel ownership of it. It has more legitimacy. So I also believe we need a big change in mindset, a big change in mentality, because and identities are polarized. They are very polarized. And attitudinal change needs to be addressed directly. We do need structural change to address the different sources of the conflict that David was talking about, economic and this sort of thing. But structural changes don't automatically lead to attitudinal changes. That needs to be attacked by itself to create a culture that promotes tolerance, forgiveness, trust, this sort of thing, healing, dignity. And to do that, it needs to happen not from the top down, not from the respectable middle class people who say, oh, yes, reconciliation, but don't do anything courageous about it, but in within the deeply polarized, most sectarian communities. The clergy that I looked at all wanted to be peace builders and had different levels of activism. They had three modes that I saw that they operated by. One of them, one kind of work was pastoral, and that was attempting to transform individuals and help build trust with their, with their pastor or priest so that they could overcome fear of the other community, the outgroup, and fear of change. Prophetic work was another role, and that was trying to affect more structural changes, you know, to create a society that had equity. And also to paint a vision so that there was something, some hope, some world that they were leading people toward that was compelling and that they could, people could really sign on to. And the third was bridge building, and that was the sort of outgroup exposure that he was talking about, where they really tried to work at the communal level to overcome the in-group, out-group divisions and unite people. And I found that clergy are particularly well suited to do this bridge building work because they use what's called the contact hypothesis in social psychology, which is well known as the most reliable and robust way to reduce prejudice. Uh, but it really works best if there are certain parameters that it follows. And clergy actually are very well suited to have those parameters in their, in their work. High, high in-group salience, they really sense that they're in their own community, reducing boundaries. If it's done right, then instead of just seeing this one Protestant guy as a particularly nice guy but an outlier, then they can, it, then outgroup exposure can actually broaden their more positive feelings toward a more positive general impression of the outgroup. And it involves forgiveness, their work involves forgiveness. As Margaret was saying, forgiveness is incredibly tough in these situations because it can't be pushed, it can't be forced, you know? That's the best way to get people not to forgive. But forgiveness is a value in these traditions. And it's often an element that clergy are able to help lead people toward. And it's a particularly important component in identity conflicts where you're trying to achieve reconciliation. It's an important part. And because they're embedded in their communities. I think that the, the parachurch organizations, like Hugh was talking about, did amazing work. But sometimes evangelical and charismatic Christians felt excluded by them because it felt as though there was a certain kind of theological approach you had to have to be involved in those. And in churches, they're in the heart of their community. They meet people exactly where they are, surrounded by their friends, and try to keep move them forward from there. Jan Galtung talks about cycles of violence and peace which reinforce themselves. So the cycle of violence, where cultural violence causes and feeds into these other kinds of violence, and the cycle of peace. They're both self-reinforcing. When people, when leaders don't do anything to challenge these cycles of violence, it just reinforces the status quo. But if their pastoral work builds trust in, their, in who they are as a leader, and then they try to do work in peace, it can bring energy away from the cycle of violence toward the cycle of peace. And this is a very confusing diagram. <laughs> Bear with me. But this is how they do it, okay? <laughs> They're taking their pastoral work to bring energy out of the cycle of violence toward the cycle of peace. 
through these three modes of operation that I mentioned earlier. They build all of this trust, and that lets them do these kinds of work. Their prophetic work builds structural peace. Their bridge building work builds cultural peace. And their pastoral work builds acceptance of the whole peace, all of the peace process, and then this reinforces each other. And what this does is it creates what's called positive peace, or just peace, peace with content. Negative peace is just the absence of killing. But positive peace is peace with content that's a lot more durable, that's going to be a lot more able to withstand challenges. The reason clergy can do this is that they have power. The kinds of power they have are not as obvious as politicians, carrots and sticks, punishments and rewards. But they do have power. They have expert power, they've been to specialized schools, and they're considered to be authorities on the sources of truth and the values and their traditions. They have legitimate power. What this is is we all have these subconscious ideas of what's right and wrong and of what people, what leaders we should be influenced by, and maybe we don't even know where we got these ideas. But when we have them, then they can be pretty stable, and so people within their communities will accept their influence to some degree. And they have referent power, and what that is is how attracted you are to somebody, how appealing they are. So if you know a person has charisma, or if a community has a great vision of a better world where they seem happy and peaceful and hopeful, then that church could be attractive to the community. People could be drawn to that, especially in comparison to this bitter, frightened, conflict-ridden society that they're stuck in. And the way that it plays out, the way that it actually works, is that when clergy work with individuals and transform them as they dramatically do all the that has ripple effects in their congregations, and it spreads to the communities. This has actually been studied about the indirect theory of contact exposure. And this spreading, this ripple, it changes the cultural norms in the congregation and the wider community. And that changes the kind of constituent pressure on the political sphere. And it ends up building momentum so that this is what IR people call you know, right moments and things like this, that the whole mood becomes more accepting and supportive of whatever peace process is going on or whatever the politicians and track when people are trying to do. Also, clergy can operate in what's, in what's called a political deficit or a vacuum where either the political peace process is broken down or communication is broken down. Clergy sometimes have unique credibility and leverage in those situations. And all of these things work together. The ripple effects, the momentum, and their unique leverage to, they, they interact in a synergistic way, that is, they reinforce each other. So that, you know, to whatever degree clergy did this, it did help to move Northern Ireland from open war to ceasefire. And there were some mediators and things that did this. And then from the impasse during the ceasefire to the Good Friday Agreement. And now from this sort of deeply entrenched sectarianism to a more stable peace. Now that sounds like a really grand claim, and I'm not trying to say that you know, all the clergy are responsible for it. It's just that this is, I think, how they work, and this is their level of effectiveness. And if we're going to you know, keep working at this track one level, keep working at the political level, and then maybe connect these local clergy with better training, with some social science information about leadership and change theory, you know, with the parachurch efforts, so that we can really maximize their ability within their communities to help operate in these ways to stabilize the peace. Father Helmick. All right. See me. <laughs> and I'll keep a watch in front of me so I get some idea when my eight minutes are coming down. I was very glad to hear so much about identities in describing this conflict because there was a particular interest of mine all the time there. I, I went over there, 1972 is when I get into it. I had had this impression uh, studying at Union Theological uh, in New York, uh, really very much intent on the common grounds of Catholics and Protestants, 
I'd learned a lot about Jews too, so that uh, the interreligious part of it was always of interest to me. One of the things I've always had to remind myself of is that the, no, the Irish conflict, not just Northern Irish, the Irish conflict does not begin in the 16th century. The Irish conflict at the time of the Reformation was 400 years old. It had all been Catholics on English and Irish sides. There was an invasion, very similar invasion by really Normans. Uh, same folks who had taken over in England a century before. And uh, religion wasn't really a factor in it. Once there was a Reformation and there was a difference between such things as Catholics and Protestants, this was adopted immediately as two banners to describe these two sides who had already been 400 years fighting each other. Uh, that has held strong ever since, so much so that even now, if you are Protestant and a Republican, you're kind of a traitor. If you are Catholic and Unionist, you're a very funny Catholic. Uh, the identities that way hold on. I was very anxious to figure out identities, and I worked it in the context of majority, minority relations. I've always found that in uh, various conflicts, you know what Adam Curl, the real father of all peace studies, uh, says is that the uh, imbalance of power is really the basic source of a conflict. Uh, majority minority, you deal with a country like South Africa where the minority was the power majority, but uh, minorities are pretty safe if the majority is content in itself. If the majority uh, has some kind of an internal conflict themselves, they need a scapegoat. And the minority is always the most obvious place to look. And <clears throat> uh, that's characteristic of majorities, so much so that you have to find out what is that internal conflict about. The minorities have a couple of characteristics. They have a grievance. Uh, they also tend to play victim. And if you play victim, we've heard about this victim as this claim to exclusive victimhood, uh, it's an invitation to violence. You get hit if you're playing victim. You really bring it on yourself. And of course, in Ireland, there is the double minority question. The Catholics are a minority in the North and a majority in the whole of Ireland, so that the Protestants have the same uh, kinds of problem to deal with as the Catholic in their identities. I was trying to reckon, uh, what is the framework of any of these conflicts? And the framework, uh, I reckon that the framework has to do with the identity. How do people know within a group your large groups uh, from Vulcan, how do they know who are we? And as I listened to Protestants in Northern Ireland for a very long time, I found that it wasn't particularly religious. It was very much that they conceived themselves as the practical inventors of democracy. Democracy was terribly important to them. And if you ask them what they mean, First of all, they would tell you that uh, that's majority rule. Well, majority rule was not a form of democracy there. It was a, a form of domination. And they all knew that. And when you penetrated further, you found that it was something right out of the 17th century. It was Cromwell, and it was the Commonwealth. And it was the idea that the good society is the one that makes it its priority preserve the rights of the dissident, non-conformist minority. Cromwell wanted that for the Puritans. He, once he was, he had a better, very bad reputation in Ireland. He was putting down what he saw as rebellions, terrible people. It's a synonym for terrorists now. Uh, in England, he actually did try to provide this kind of freedom for Catholics. Uh, he was foiled there because the Romans wouldn't, uh, wouldn't tolerate that. But 
that is very deeply embedded in Northern Irish Protestants, that they are the protectors, practically the inventors. They sell you these tea towels with all of the American presidents of, uh, of uh, uh, Scots-Irish descent, uh, American Declaration of Independence Constitution are written by Scots-Irish and represent those ideals. And uh, they do have a bad conscience because for them, the dissident, nonconformist minority happens to be Catholic, but those are their scapegoats. Why are they so afraid of the Catholics? And I come down very hard on the Catholic structures. I published an article back in 1977 when I'd been listening carefully for five years about the church structure and violence in Northern Ireland that there is such a dominance, a, nowadays we'll use the word clericalism. <coughs> this was so absolute in the Irish Catholic Church. If you were an ordinary person in Ireland, any part of Ireland, and you had some sort of a, sc a scuffle with your pastor, you had lost. You might as well go away. There's no future for you here. That could be that you're in a bad marriage or checked up. Uh, or it could be that you owned a piece of uh, land in the center of town where you thought it'd be a nice place for a filling station. The pastor didn't think so. Or he just figured you were one of these people who looked funny at pastors. And uh, your future was ended. And if you were a public person, if you were a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a politician, the thing that you had to fear more than anything else in Catholic Ireland was to have some sort of a scrap with a bishop. The expression was that you got a belt of the crozier. If you had a quarrel with the bishops in general, uh, you were finished in politics. If you were a politician in Northern Ireland, uh, it was presumed that you're going to be prejudiced, you're going to be uh, unfair, you're going to be discriminating, all of that, and the Catholics uh, whether they were bishops or uh, working people, didn't like that, but they figured there's not, nothing you can do with that. Uh, it's always going to be that way. However, if a, a Protestant politician in the North laid a hand on one of the things that were really the pillars of the political privileged position of the Catholic bishops, that could not be done. Uh, those were anything to do with marriage, divorce, all of these family uh, uh, issues. It was schools. If you touch those, that's third rail. Or the caring things like hospitals. Those had to be left untouched. A Protestant politician who messed with those was finished. His, his uh, career was over. And Protestants knew that. They had this terrible fear of Catholic Ireland. If Catholic Ireland ever took charge, democracy was all over. And people had their explanations. What are the troubles about? Well, they had this sense that uh, if you were a Protestant, or for that matter, if you were the British, the problem was the IRA. What do you do about the IRA? You, you shoot them. If you were Catholic, the problem was the Brits. The Brits, uh, that of course is the army and it's the system. Uh, the only thing that's going to be understood is violence. And in both cases, those are the explanations of what the trouble is and how to solve it, shooting in both cases. but. Both of those are really specimens of the denial thing that the psychotherapists would talk about because everybody knew the problem was that here you had two communities. They didn't like to be called two communities. You had two groups of people living in the same space who hadn't figured out how to do it. Pluralism was simply not even thought of. And uh, everybody knew that that was the real problem. I had this experience eventually. I started off with an assumption. All of these people who were doing things that I really didn't like, 
of the shooting and so forth. These were people who had put their own lives at great risk in order to serve what they understood to be the interests of their community. And that had to be respected. Uh, my assumption was that these people were not psychopaths. They were doing things for reasons that made sense to them. And therefore, the first thing that I felt I had to do was to get to know them, get to know all of them, get to know people in the communities, in the working communities, get to know the paramilitaries and their leaders, get to know the leadership of every paramilitary group, the clergy, the politicians, the whole lot. And with a sense of respect for all of them. I have a Jesuit thing here. We have the principle that it is most fitting to save the proposition of another rather than to condemn it as false. I don't think that's what people usually think of their Jesuits. They think we're supposed to have all the answers. But the, really to uh, save the proposition of the other is the really workable thing. If I'm going to spend my life winning arguments, I, I'm never going to win anything else. Uh, eventually, I was doing this with prisoners. This is my conviction that the solution, so far as the solution is gone in Northern Ireland, was the initiative of the militants. It was not something led by the good people or the politicians. The militants decided they had done with the violence. Uh, that came, to, came through very clearly during the 1981 hunger strike. I spent about six weeks of that hunger strike as the go-between between, between the IRA's Army Council and the British government. Heard a lot from what their mentality was. I had already gotten to know UBF people extremely well. And many people that I very much admired there uh, and UDA for that matter too. Uh, I began after doing that work during the hunger strike to visit the cell blocks in the Longkesh prison regularly, all of them. And even after I came back after nine years living in the neighborhood, uh, I would travel over for uh, the next dozen years regularly every time I got word that uh, I could get into the prison the next day and hop right on the plane from Washington or from here. And uh, I had a sort of constant theme there. I believe that the prison is really always a university. Uh, mm -hmm. For most of the time of the troubles, what was taught in that university was guerrilla tactic. Uh, my idea during the hunger strike as a way of dealing with the issues of the hunger strike was that the prison should be made the place for the planning of the peace. And I'm very much convinced that not only did the militant groups with their leadership outside make the initiatives that brought about the ceasefires and the whole process of negotiation, with a lot of involvement of the community, on their part particularly. I find now that some of the most constructive people in the Northern Ireland community are the ex-prisoners who had this kind of experience and really turned against the war. Uh, if the people who are the war don't decide to make the peace, it's not going to happen. So that it was in the prison that the thinking was done. They had plenty of time on their hands. They met regularly, they discussed these themes, and I think that is really where the peace has come from. Uh, I had a mantra in the conversations I had with them that uh, kept repeating itself constantly, that they needed to accommodate each other. That sounds like a very low level of reconciliation, but accommodation to understand the needs of these other people that they're always going to live with, that they had to become the guarantors of one another's difference. Uh, that attitude, I find people like Gusty Spence in the prison. I think he must be a familiar name. Gusty was an extraordinary example of that. He trained people like Davy Irvine, Billy Hutchinson to that. And Gusty made the effort to cross the lines. He went to the wire, as he said, to find out what was going on with the Catholic prisoners, with the IRA. 
at the Y, he would tell them he wanted to learn Irish. When I asked him, now, what were you trying to learn, Irish or them? He called, of course, he was looking to understand them. And understanding them was really the critical thing. This is breaking across the boundaries of these identities. And at my, I think my eight minutes must be done. So, <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. Thanks very much, all our presenters. Who could think that five people could um, uh, restrain themselves? Um, uh, look, thank you so much. Um, so we have got a pretty decent time for um, discussion. Do help yourselves to some food. Um, and I'll, I'll try and moderate. It'd be good to get as many questions as possible. Um, so if you could make your questions relatively brief, just say who you are, make the question. And I'm not sure that everyone on the panel has to answer every question, right? So we'll, we'll try and use some discretion. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll just give another five minute talk each and you'll be even more ticked off at this. So, um, so it's open, uh, please, um, uh, any questions, either directed to a particular person or to a particular subject um, that, 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 that are old. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sure, I can say something pretty quick about that because it's been very hard to find any way to memorialize all communities at the same time. So most memorials are what we would call single community, um, which is just one more example of this phenomenon of the deeply divided society. Uh, so there have been struggles to find conceptual ways to memorialize everybody at once, would be, which would be a kind of way of stating who we all are together. And that's been remarkably difficult. And um, most people would say that the most effective um, cross-community memorial is a book called Lost Lives that has a paragraph telling about each person who died in the conflict. Uh, anything to add to that view? I, I don't, I, I mean, I sure. can tell you about people destroying other people's memorials, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. but um, this is basically yeah. the answer to your question. I mean, one, one of the major efforts was the, the former um, prison called Long Cash. That's uh, right. What do you do, yeah. what do you do with the <coughs> prison? And, uh, you know, there was all sorts of efforts to try and find agreement of how that, that building could be used that would be, uh, you know, both communities could organ, could honor, but it, it uh, fell apart. There was even like something like, was it $40 million or $14 million available from the, the, uh, sure the European something. Union? And that wasn't enough. <laughs> to, that wasn't <laughs> enough. <laughs> so so, the, so Mark, what Mark is saying is after the case that to find a memorial that both communities can say yes to, is a, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not there yet. I, it's been interesting to see, though, how some of the clergy have been trying to handle this with some of the memorials from the Troubles era, such as the Oma bombing and things like this, where you'll have, you know, both Catholic and Protestant clergy coming out for the memorial, you know, services there. But the danger then is that clergy can make their own community feel as though they've abandoned them if they push too hard in those directions. There is an interesting group in Northern Ireland, uh, I talked to them a few years ago, called NIAM, and it's one of those initial names, Nor Northern Ireland, A-M-H, I can't fill in the other letters, but it's a grouping of clergy and psycho psychologists, psychoanalysts, and the psychs have really felt that they need to teach the clergy something about how to talk to their own people. I always found during the time I was there that uh, 
the clergy were too tempted to talk about sweet Jesus and have nothing to do with what was actually going on. Uh, a lot of people were very much uh, in sympathy with their communities and could be helpful to them. Uh, there were, uh, uh, what are the names now? The Catholic who did, did so much with. Jerry Reynolds. Uh, hmm? Jerry Reynolds and Ken. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Oh, the fellow down at the Clonard who had so much to do with Jerry Alec Reed. Alec, Alec Reed. Alec Reed and Roy McGee were clergy who were tremendous help. They really discussed the issues of conflict with the people who were leadership in the paramilitary organizations, helped them come to much more constructive ways of dealing with it. And as I say, I find now that the people who have the prison experience and have been in it are the most helpful people. Um, thanks very much for all your presentations. This, maybe I'll direct it at you, David, because you gave the sobering statistic. The most sobering fact that I learned was that 93 percent of school children were still educated in segregated settings. Why is that? Is that a complete lack of government will to engage in something like forced busing? to move people out of their neighborhoods to go to schools. I don't know anything about the state of the public education or government schools, if they even exist in Northern Ireland. That seems like a stunning lack of will at the top to actually address the issue <coughs> in some way. Well, I'd be glad to take a first stab at that, but there will be people at the table who may know more about this. I used to do some work on this, on the, the, the history of trying to get an, an agreed educational system in Ireland. I fell victim to um, the same kind of thing that happened in some parts of Boston and so on, that actually fell victim to um, how you could uh, get an agreed curriculum or not. And, and what happened after the um, uh, partition uh, especially is that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the state controlled schools, um, w which are paid for out of taxation, um, uh, do probably have a Protestant ethos whatever that might be. Um, uh, the Catholic Church, and uh, Father Helmut will know this uh, uh, better than I do, ha has a strong attachment to a schooling system in Northern Ireland and gets quite a big government subvention to keep it going. So, I mean, um, uh, so Father Helmut, I think, made the absolute right point. This is something that's very difficult to attack or to... Um, now, there has been, over the past 10, 20, 30 years, an integrated schooling sector, which at first started to gain some steam and, and momentum. Um, and you know, a bunch of people used to teach in these schools and so on. And there was a hope, I think, that those that the percentage of children in integrated schools would just constantly go up. And there was government policy to try and uh, urge this, you know, they thought it was a good thing. And there are now some, you know, schemes, I've just read about this in the last week or two, that they are uh, trying to bring Catholic and Protestant schools together on a shared site, you know, 10 of these experiments um, uh, that are, um, now what that will do, I have no idea, you know, whether it will just uh, be another way of institutionalizing difference, um, or, or whether it will have some positive outcome. But there's, there's no question that um, both the, the way in which the state system has had a kind of both explicit and implicit Protestant set of, of, and the Catholic Church's determination to retain control of, of its school system, that is a real problem. And it's very difficult to tackle it without appearing either to be, <coughs> to um, uh, be getting at the church or, or, or to uh, force the state to exercise the kind of muscle that would almost certainly produce some kind of pushback. And the other thing is that these schools, I mean, so segregated education is a big problem. Class segregated education is an even bigger problem in Northern Ireland. Because in both the Catholic and the Protestant side, there are very fine grammar schools, they're called there, where you can get a really fine education, get your way to university and on you go. For Protestant kids, that's out of the province, often. Um, for, for Catholic children, it, it can sometimes mean a, a trip south afterwards. Um, 
But if you fail the, what was the 11 plus test and you didn't go to either a Catholic or a Protestant grammar school, you were in big trouble uh, in terms of your social aspirations. So there is uh, both a segregated and a class separated system where both middle classes have been quite happy to uh, keep sustained because they benefit from it. The real victims of that story are the working classes in both areas who get substandard education and, um, uh, and really um, uh, develop a, a poor skill set and a poor opportunity set. That's where a lot of the recruitment comes from. Um, so, but you, some people will have different, is that a roughly accurate statement or? or yeah, I think so. I mean, in, in the Catholic community, you know, we grew up, the only, the, the, one of the th things was, the, the only thing they felt we controlled was the schools, you know? Right. Yeah. So why would you give that up? I mean, like, why would you share that? But the, only, the only thing you felt you held on to, you know? But again, I think it gets at this deeper issue. And I mean, I, I interviewed about 16 of the, uh, <coughs> the leaders from the various political parties and uh, before the Good Friday Agreement. And, you know, like one of the unionists said to me, you know, about sharing power. He says, of course, he says, the two can't live together. They're incompatible. They're different as light and darkness. You know, there's that sense that they're <clears throat> as different as night and day. So while that's the case, no one wants integrated education because that messes that up. It messes up the idea that, you know, uh, we know who we are and we're not them. And so, you know, there, is, there, isn't, the, hmm. there isn't the desire for it. And there's also, people are more afraid of censure from within their community than they are of the other community at this point. And so it's not just, you know, people aren't necessarily so much afraid of educating themselves with the other communities so much as what, what it would cost them to try to promote that. Jeff, what do you say? Um, I have the sense, listening to all this and, you know, and what I know about the country, but there's a way in which what we have now is sort of a baton. It's a, it's, you all talk about structures. You use the word, David, institutionalized sectarianism. We talked about educational structures and all that. And uh, it's like we, we have the old uh, experience, except for the fighting, you know, it, in, a, in a certain way. And thinking about other places like Lebanon, where they have institutionalized sectarianism and whatever, but there's now an effort to renegotiate that. Um, shifting regional alliances and facts on the ground. You know, if, as you as you play the movie ahead, twenty years. What are the what are the demographic changes? What are the sort of things? What's going on in the among youth? You know, what could what could make these structures that have been you know kind of stamped out early on here begin to fray apart? And is there any way to sort of accelerate that? Well, the youth are an interesting question. In the Protestant circles, the youth are actually more conservative than some of the, you know, 60-year-olds because they didn't live through the, the killing, and I think there's more of a sense of hanging on to their identity there. Whereas in the Catholic circles, the youth are actually more progressive than the older generations. And uh, there's a lot of flight, especially, um, I mean, among anybody who can afford it, you know, there's, I think that, you know, I, I had a graph I could have shown you that the outlook among youth is um, probably only about, I don't know, 15% of them think that things are going to actually get better and um, economically or in terms of peace. And that's actually improvement over in the autumn. There's a pretty mellow marching season this year, which helped to calm things mm -hmm. down. Um, the flight is very largely Protestant. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, the, <laughs> the way that the separate province was set up, Ulster, which is not all of Ulster, it's six out of the nine counties of Ulster, uh, that boundary was set in order to have a two-to-one majority of Protestants. Now they are very close to even numbers, and there has been an extraordinarily high birth rate in Ireland all the way through since they were up close to nine million people at the time of the uh, 1840s famine. They dropped down to about four and a half million and stayed there despite this enormously high birth rate uh, because of immigration. Uh, now the Protestants are likelier to leave from Northern Ireland 
if they have a chance to get out because they lost. And uh, the Catholics have more of a sense that things are improving and uh, are likelier to stay there. And birth rates aren't what they used to be. So that demographic balance has shifted, as, as Anna oh, yeah. has said, and it's now, and of course this is both, you know, a, a, a generator of fear as well, because there's a sense of um, if this is shifting, I mean, I mean demography is an inexact science, and people make various predictions of when that will tilt, you know, and it's still a, a, a Protestant majority in Northern Ireland, I think it's about 55, 45, something like that, closer to 50, 50 amongst the under 30s. Um, um, but, um, so probably sometime within the next 20, 30 years, 40 years maybe, that balance will shift and then that will be an interesting moment of, um, um, though of course, you know, an unrecognized fact in Northern Ireland is that there are a, a number of Catholics um, who um, would not, uh, you know, who, who, who still might um, uh, prefer the union, not a very large percentage, and there are some Protestants who would prefer a United Ireland, not a very large percentage. The other thing that, you know, that, that has drawn att uh, attention in the last while has been the voting turnout at, at elections in, in Northern Ireland, which is running at around about 50%, mm -hmm. which um, is pretty low. I mean, obviously not by American standards. <laughs> 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 so the, I would like to say this expresses a disenchantment with the kind of democracy, but, <laughs> um, uh, having just voted in the first, my first American election. But, but that is a, um, a somewhat unnerving um, participation rate. Um, um, and it's, it's not substantially higher among young people, it's, it, it's, it's across the board. How, what's the breakdown within that 50%? Is there any sort of uh, disparity between the two communities? Or is it not, not too much, actually. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's pretty similar. Um, 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 but the point you made, it made me think of something that you said in your presentation, that because of the way that the political structures are set up in Northern Ireland, you know, with a, 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 a prime minister who represents the majority party, which is at presently the DUP, Democratic Unionist Party, um, and the person who represents um, nationalism, which is currently Martin McGuinness um, from Sinn Féin, um, that um, there is a way in which it's very difficult for someone to emerge uh, as a kind of uniter, uh, a figurehead for the country, uh, because they are very careful to, you know, keep appealing to their base. Because if you don't, I mean, what happened to the two Nobel Peace Prize winners was political extinction within five or ten years. I mean, the <laughs> Social Democratic and Labour Party, John Hume fronted, and the uh, Official Unionist Party that David Trimble. I mean, they both paid a heavy price for that, um, and it was the extreme parties. Uh, that built the, uh, the, 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 the consensus or ex extreme. Mm -hmm. but, but, um, but Don't ever forget that the Catholic Church is not as popular as it used to be. There was always a very heavy anti-clericalism in the Catholic population because of all this domination, and people were kept thoroughly intimidated. Nobody's intimidated anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they have been affected so much by the whole sex abuse crisis. Mm -hmm. I've argued a friend of mine is this man who is now the papal nuncio to Northern Ireland, Charlie Brown. I told him when he came in that he would find Lucy there ready yeah. to pull the football out as soon as he tried to kick it. But uh, the, the sex abuse, I wrote to him, sent him the, the article I had written back in 1977 about this structural uh, uh, thing in the Catholic Church that was so responsible for the Protestant fears, and that this was the same thing. It's the same clericalism. When you have all of this sex abuse, that's not about sex, that's about domination and power. Mm -hmm. So it's the same source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the confessional yeah. system was necessary, I think, to move from conflict to peace. But I, I mean, I think just like in Lebanon, like you're saying, they have to find new ideas about governance to transcend those boundaries and, you know, figure out how to get past that because it does seem to enshrine 
a separation. I, I mean, how they're going to do it is anybody's guess because Lebanon hasn't <coughs> figured that out either. You know, I mean, it'd be nice to look to Lebanon and say, well, they're doing that pretty well, but I wouldn't know that anybody would really say yeah. that yet. You know? mm -hmm. Well, you've got a population shift there, too, yeah. like you're talking about coming in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's what's uh, that changed today. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a question here and then one here. Yeah. So. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Donna Hicks, and I also want to thank the presenters because I think you did a great job of so much to think about. Um, I'm over at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, and I'm intrigued uh, by Father Ray uh, Helmick's idea of working with the former prisoners hmm. because I think there's some moral authority there, and perhaps even moral authority that isn't like you were saying, the Catholic Church is eroding, right? That, that yeah. concept of the Catholic Church is eroded, but I was... The identity is strong. Yeah, right. And I had, I mean, the reason I'm so intrigued by this, I had, um, I've been, been in Libya recently and done some work in Libya, and there are actually dozens of what I call Nelson Mandela's in Libya. Dozens. There are people who survived the most horrible, horrible circumstances under the Gaddafi regime. And it reminded me of uh, the, uh, the Long uh, uh prison when I went in and visited. And I was thinking, these are the people who can actually affect mm -hmm. attitude and cultural change sure. because they had no, you know, no uh, leading figures, who, you know, political figures. And I'm thinking about the, the church, the clergy in Northern Ireland on both sides, teaming up with the with the with the political prisoners mm -hmm. as a partners in this you know idea of reconciliation and change and all the things that we're yearning for in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So but wouldn't that be a remarkable partnership? And I'm wondering if the if the panel could um, just reflect on that for a second. I see that you know there's a lot of repugnance against the paramilitaries in the churches um, because you know, it's, they want to be seen as respectable. I mean, especially in the Protestant churches. And then at the same time, you know, some crime happens and it's like, let's call out the boys. You know, I mean, it's just... what about just, David Irvine? He well, really wrote I'm not saying it doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that you get a lot of repugnance. You get a lot of repugnant yeah. attitudes. And then you get some pretty progressive clergy who are basically admitting that the best theology is coming out of the paramilitaries now and wanting to do that, but their parishioner pressure of repugnance is <coughs> tough. And in the Catholic Church, again, a lot of the paramilitaries feel so thoroughly abandoned by the clergy who really just wanted to support the middle class idea of let's keep making money and keep our heads down, that there's a lot of repugnance in that direction. There's one priest, Joe McVeigh, who wrote sort of a liberation theology for Northern Ireland, which I think a lot of the more Republican people resonate with. Um, but again, it's a minority. I think there's an enormous potential there, uh, but those are the obstacles it would yeah. need to overcome and why it hasn't happened more, even though it seems so inspiring mm -hmm. in this one way. You know, there's I think one distinction that might be made that might help clarify this a little bit, I think, is that, um, I mean, I think Father Helmick is absolutely, you know, both our panelists are absolutely right, it's some of the most creative figures, and you've named some of them, like David mm -hmm. Irvine, Martin McGuinness, and others. And, mm -hmm. um, but, um, and these are people who got into this were through ideology of some kind that they had, they thought they were fighting for something important to get the Brits out of Ireland or to defend their way of life or whatever. But inevitably around that uh, core, um, there is a penumbra of um, violence that is not quite so noble, um, that is intimidatory, is, um, you know, does um, uh, take out violence in women, children, um, uh, runs rackets of drugs and cartels and criminality. So it's not all, a, 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 you know, a, a, um, so it, I, I think it's a, um, I, I, I do think that uh, Father Hamlick is right, some of the most creative peace builders were, the, were exactly the people we've been talking about who were right in at the, at the trenches and had had enough. And but, they had personal transformations too. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there is a much wider, what we shouldn't really, you know, lose sight of, uh, a, a bigger trail of violence. I mean, I, I mean, for example, this recent survey on violence against children is not a particularly in, uh, exciting prospect. Um, uh, uh, so so that, that's still going on. 
Um, um, and that, that pressure's coming from the communities as well. I mean, I, I, re I remember talking to a Sinn Féin person, a pal politician once, who was saying, you know, this, this guy who had a drug dealer issue was coming in, and he was saying, see, now everybody wants me to go have this guy be beat up. That's what they want, and if I don't do that, they'll see me as a weak leader. You know, and so it's not, it's coming from both sides and it needs transformation at all levels, but I, it's a great idea. <laughs> ben, you had, were saying some very powerful things about the po potential of people in the prisons. Yeah. Do you want to respond yeah, to this It's very much too? like what happened in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I do a lot with Palestinians now and I know that this is going on in those prisons. Mm -hmm. I know who Nelson Mandela is. His name is Mawan Bagudi. Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, uh, Northern Ireland, I think the person who would have been the real Nelson Mandela was Gusty Spence. Mm -hmm. Gusty took it on himself as a prisoner very early, when the only prisoners were Protestant before the six, uh, 69 outbreak that landed all the Catholics in prison. Gusty undertook to find out something about his country. He said the only history he'd learned he had learned was that good King Billy won the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 and all the rest of history happened in England. And uh, he really made a point of understanding uh, both Protestant and Catholic history in Ireland and instructing all of his fellow prisoners. He then, once they got to Long Kesh at the, at the time when it was all of the Nissen huts, he made a point always of going to the wire, wire and getting to know the Catholic prisoners so that he was a very important catalyst there too mm -hmm. in bringing them to some understanding. I've always found that in dealing with the paramilitary groups, which I did long before I got to go to the prisons, they had very negative stereotypes about each other. Uh, they never talked to anyone outside the bubble. and. Uh, uh, to be engaged in a conversation, this was the value of being an outsider, uh, to be able to have the conversation with all of them even quite separately and be able to report back in each group what the others thought, mm -hmm. uh, how they ticked. These, uh, you know, it was a very transformational experience among all of these paramilitaries. Where they are now, you know, these guys came out of prison after 14, 15, 18 years. They, uh, if they were married or if they had children, uh, the wife had been the one who brought up the family. And now this middle-aged hunk comes home and thinks he's in charge. And what do the children think of that? And uh, uh, that was also a very educational experience for them. Yeah. Jocelyn, and then... Yeah, I have a question on so this institutionalization of the sectarian divide and the collusion of the clerical establishment on both sides with that. But it seems to me by hearing from you that there are also um, attempts to distance from the citizens distance themselves from the clerical establishment. Yeah. And how does it go with alternative vision outside the sectarian divide? In other words, how does a, do the citizens move away? Because in your presentation, in your PowerPoint, it was a way to go, but I was not sure that this is what should be or what it is. Is the sense of religious leaders bringing cohesion? Uh, I was not it, it was not clear to me how this, because it seems that religious groups can be either for the good or for the bad. So what we have discussed is, is a lot of the bad in terms of establishment and, and belonging. But what about all these attempts of secession, contestation of the clerical institution? What do people do to contest this sectarian institutionalization or contestualization? from within their own religious community without automatically um, giving allegiance to the hierarchy of the clergy. Because one way that Lebanon is evolving is exactly that. There is a, an institutional community organization and you have more fluidity between communities. 
but it took some time and some processes I would like to know what's going on more Catholic and Protestants on the ground well, I want to make sure I understand your question so you're saying how much of how much of what I presented is what should happen how much of it no, is, is what is happening. is happening yes. and I, I mean I was talking about what clergy who are trying to be peace builders actually did but there is a real range of um, activism levels because the pressure, clergy, unlike most professions, deal with tremendous pressure from their clients, their parishioners. Mm -hmm. They have so much power over their professional success and job security. And studies show that they use it. I mean, in the US, when clergy tried to stand up for fair housing in California, you know, in the racist debates, they paid the cost. I mean, they, you know, they're, and so it's, it really is very, very difficult for these clergy. So, you know, how, how much are they doing this and how much does it matter? I mean, to me, what it seems as though is that what clergy do is they move into a community and they assess what's called the level. Every community has its level of how sectarian it is and what things are appropriate here and what things aren't. I mean, in some communities, it's okay to shop at the Catholic butcher and in some it's not, you know? So they figure out the level and they figure out who the power brokers are in their congregation and then what they do is they try very hard to figure out what they can get away with and not pay too big a cost. And for some of them, it's just individual conversations and trying to kind of work with individuals. And for some of them, eventually they're able to try to start, you know, moving things toward meeting with some other people from down the road. And then for some of them, it's removing a flag and, you know, standing up to the paramilitaries who try to tell them they can't remove that flag and all of these, you know, incredibly brave things. But um, the, as far as the institutionally entrenched, you know, the upper level leadership, I mean, I, there are some bishops that have really done an enormous amount to try to promote this, and some that have given lip service to it but done nothing, and some that I think have supported the divide. And so it's sort of across the board. But, but the question was more about the conflict with believers and, and the citizens outside the clergy. We see everywhere that people are getting empowered to do and to act on the name of religion without going through the hierarchy. Because yeah, that's where the parachurch the groups... Where this hierarchy is discredited for different reasons. So what's happening there? This was not here today. That's where the parachurch groups that Hugh was involved in really mm -hmm. shown. I think, they, you know, as far as I can tell, there's not much. Mm. You know, uh, there's one uh, uh, sociologist in Canada who writes about Northern Ireland and, and he uses a very powerful metaphor. He says, if you go there, it's like, uh, the two communities are like radio waves. Radio waves are in the air, they intermingle, but they never touch. No. Because the history, the history of that touch, you see, is explosive. So, you, you, like, you go there and people are living around, but they're living around one another. So the church is, you know, it's, it's still, um, it's, it's, it's still an identity, you know, keeps the fold together. But you, and, you and know, I, could we, I just ask, this is the stupidest level of question, but how, do, how, do, how does everyone know who one another is? There are 12, there are 12 cues. Well, okay. <laughs> one, what is your name? Like, I'm, I'm an O'Dohardy. Okay, so we got that name. Where I went to school, mm -hmm. which newspaper I read, which doctor I go to. But do people mingle without asking each other these questions, that, you know. Yes, but, oh, but, but what you're telling, there's a, there's a study done on this that's called telling. So we meet, we're immediately telling. We don't, like, we don't talk about it, but we're telling which group you come from. Mm -hmm. That's going on, in, you know. Do we dress place. differently? No, not the dress is not, not so much. And the, the, um, the aspiration <laughs> of the letter H yes. is said to be one of the clearest giveaways. Mm. So how does it sound differently? <laughs> Say H, Hugh. H. 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 Oh now my. you've got Hugh and me place. H. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, there are these multiple codes, but I mean... The, what, are, what are the others besides of the people I'm listening for? Which, uh, which soccer team you support? Okay. Mm -hmm. Where you shop? I mean, my mother would never have shopped in Moore's store, you know, she wouldn't go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, the neighborhood you live in, they just, you know. They, they so are there these groups who have had your, that level of uh, insight of 
you know, uh, uh, meeting the contact theory, you know, that uh, you've, you've had a moment of understanding something new about yourself in relation to another. Are there sort of teams of people who go about, uh, young people, clergy, lay people, who, uh, who go about across that divide sort of doing team workshops, or is that just po yeah. uh, po There impossible? are efforts. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean the most, probably the most well-known one would be the Coromila community, and, mm -hmm. which has you know, started even before the Troubles uh. that was bringing Protestant and Catholic together. And they, have, they grew up alongside the Troubles. So they do this, you know, it's that their program is, is about bringing people together for, to encounter, you know, mm -hmm. and they, yeah, yeah. 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 but it's um, outside, outside that, it, it, yes, Community Relations mm -hmm. Council, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah. the actual churches, you know, like parishes in, in, in town, they, they don't, they don't take that initiative, you know, they don't bring people together, like, well, the main thing they I always heard now. from, uh, they used to. <laughs> The main thing I would hear from churches was, don't blame us. And that was a very negative response to the trouble. And uh, when it came then to, uh, uh, I'm losing track of where I'm heading here. Uh, the don't blame us was the basic response. When it comes to dealing with institutions, you know, a church, or I think this is, has to be true of any religion, it's an association of people. Uh, solipsism doesn't really work. If you have a faith, you need a communion in the faith. You have to have a community that ha has it, that shares it. And as soon as you have an association of people, there has to be a structure. Uh, as much or as little structure as you need according to the size and complexity of the thing, but some kind of structure. And once you have the structure, you have an immediate problem. You always hope that the objectives and the interests of the association, of the reasons the people have come together in an association, will be replicated exactly by the leadership. But the leadership is always likely, or is almost inevitably, going to have a special interest in continuing to be the leadership. So there is that much divergence in objective and interest. And if that, you know, we all learn how to deal with a little bit of divergence. Uh, if the divergence grows, uh, that's more and more of a problem. And if you find that your leadership's main interest is power, which happens ever so easily, then you're in a real trouble, and it's likely to be so entrenched that it's very difficult to deal with that. So, hmm. um, another question back there. Um, me, uh, Shoshana, I'm a doctoral student here at Comparative Religious Law. Um, I was very interested in the idea of identity and how identity, um, identity as in what I am not, as opposed to what I am, um, I was very moved by uh, the things you said. I was very, very, very moved by that. I had a question about identity. Um, you were talking about schools and about segregation and about how that works. I'm wondering, how do you maintain, or, or maybe you could think about, how do you maintain the beauty of the individual identities and not blur them? Because um, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm neither Catholic nor Protestant, but I respect both. And I would like to think that there would continue to be Catholicism and continue to be Protestant uh, Christianity. And there's, there's even um, liturgically, religiously, there are deep traditions to both. I would not, I, I'm, I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong, that the schools have a religious component and a religious curriculum. And I'm not sure how you could blend the schools um, and still educate good Catholics to, to go to Catholic church and, and live a Catholic life and for Protestants to continue to live a, a Protestant life. Is there a way to um, maintain the, the respect for each identity? Is there a hope for that and not to try to sort of blur them and merge them, um, these identities in a way that would um, lose uh, a richness that we need to maintain? 
is there a hope for that, or is it, or when we talk about peace and, and about bringing people together, is the only way to do it to blur identities? I just wonder. Do you want to say well, something? I guess this is a follow-up question. I think it's you, if I got the right name. Well, you said we, we can't, if you have these conversations, really a real conversation, you can't come away without being changed. So why is that not a good thing to follow? Why not schedule these for everybody? So that they, why don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been, been yeah. 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 trying to. I, I mean, I think that yeah. it's a, it, it's not, I, mean, I think it's, it's not the, like, from, from a, for example, myself as, like, identifying as Irish, or, and, and uh, it's not that I give up the Irishness, it's, it's what has to be given up is the attachment that's based on fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The attachment yeah. that's based on this deep fear that if I somehow risk taking on board the other's view of the world, that, some, that something awful will happen, you know, mm -hmm. it's... That's that's the piece. It's not the actual cultural piece, or the, mm -hmm. all that's rich. But we can't enjoy that richness while my sense of my very survival depends on keeping the other out there. You know, but that's I think that's the challenge of dialogue. Yeah. Maybe time for one more question. I'm keen to keep. Yeah. yeah just a quick uh, comment, I suppose, that follows up on this issue of identity. My name is Mustafa Tara Ali. I'm a postdoc here at HDS. And I, I work on this issue of, of building, constructing identity. And I, I want to raise the issue of, um, uh, and this is from two perspectives that I want to raise this. First, as a practitioner, I've done years of work in mentoring Islamic youth on the issue of counter-radicalization. And I've usually done that within a civilizational frame whereby it was done in Australia, but, but I look at it as a we we're Western, right? We're, and it's this issue of what is the Western project that now needs to adapt to this issue of a new wave of migrants coming from the Levant or the Middle East or the wider Islamic world. And it's, it's here that I personally, growing up in the West, that I felt that there is a bit of a rigidity in terms of what is the concept Western? Is, is the West really something that began with the scientific revolution? If that's the case, then we find the Islamic astronomers themselves <coughs> were the predecessors to Copernicus. Mm -hmm. And so there is a story in itself there. So, and here I think even these religious communities in Ireland, Protestant, the, the Protestant religion itself began as part of this wave of revolution in the 15th, 16th century that saw parallel to it the development also of, of this scientific revolution. So we can't separate the two. And the issue of the Enlightenment period that saw political reform was itself grounded in, in a scientific revolution. So the question that it's put, put forward now is where, where is the role of science in maintaining a public space for all? You know, what is science's role in providing a political philosophy that could allow space for this development of a new identity that is in some way universal, but comfortable for individuals as well. You should, one of you should tell the joke, <coughs> the joke about the person walking along who gets drawn into an alley by a thug. You know this joke, right? The famous joke. Yes, you should yes. tell it, not me. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a variety of, <laughs> of versions of this joke, but, you know, someone says, uh, you know, a, a group drags someone in and says, um, uh, what religion are you? And the person says, I, I'm actually not religious, I'm an atheist. And then they say, well, look, are you a Protestant atheist? Or, yeah. or Catholic yeah. atheist? Yeah. So, um, and there is a real truth behind the joke, yeah. because sure. what um, sure. is at stake here that she was well brought out in these 12 litmus test signs is just how deep these things are. These recognition signals go down through education, they go down through neighborhood, they go down through accent and name, they go down through heritage, views of Irish and British history, the sport you play, where you drink, where you shop, where you go to church. There's endless ways of doing this. And, and so that's why the identities are strong, right? That there's just, they're, they're multiply made up of very powerful binding <coughs> elements. So that's going to take a long time. And the question back there was, you know, can you meld these in some ways without losing the... And I think that's a very uh, difficult thing 
to do, to be honest. I mean, I, I struggle with this a lot on Northern Ireland over many years of thinking, look, would the whole province be a whole lot better off without religion completely? Get rid of these sectarian schools. Just tell the Catholic Church you can't have these schools. Tell um, the state sector that these cannot be Protestant schools. Or, in other words, just have a completely, um, you know, religious free zone in schools. But you know, as she says, I mean, I, you know, for for many Northern Irish Catholics, the, the school is one place that wasn't that you could have some control over the teaching and the organisation and the and so on. So. It, the more you get at these things, the more difficult it is. And what I think many people would agree happened in 1998 was a very sophisticated kind of settlement that was brokered by a lot of civil service background. It was brokered by a lot of political maneuvering. It was done by a lot of, and um, to be sure, there was some, you know, uh, prisoner um, and paramilitary. Um, but um, that, that, that was a moment where, where there was a lot of concentrated effort and there were contiguous governments who wanted it. The British, American and Irish governments all wanted this settlement. Um, and there was a lot of investment came into it. Um, but the extent to which it ever broke down those identities that uh, he was spoken about, that's really the issue because they still survive in there. And the forces that keep them there are relatively untouched by some of this superstructure mm -hmm. of change. So you have a, a, essentially a kind of settlement that isn't a reconciliation. And that's where we are. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, will the settlement survive without reconciliation? Um, and is the settlement strong enough to promote reconciliation? And that's roughly where the situation is poised. And there's a little unease, I think, you know, people have mentioned this, I mean, certainly going back to Ireland over the last two or three years, there's some unease about what's happening there, that the, the two political parties that have emerged as the strongest parties uh, don't much like one another. And um, uh, the, mm -hmm. the centre ground is not enormously strong. <coughs> um, people are very concerned about the economic prospects of the place. Um, and whether this subvention that helps sustain it can go on indefinitely. Um, because there's certainly many within the English state, British state, um, who would like to scale that down and, um, and how that would then play out. So it's a, it's a kind of a, it's so much better than it was in the 1970s that we've lived through where, you know, there, there were over a thousand people killed in four years. So we're, we're so much be in a better place. If you go to Belfast now, it's like a, a city you can walk around and not be in fear of a, an incident or a bombing or whatever. But there's still, you know, there's, this is not a done deal. There's still mm -hmm. a ways to go. So look, I know we've, we've um, I want to thank our, our presenters. They've done a wonderful job. Um,